Just because something sits on a rock doesn't mean that it will last forever. The fate of our Confederate monuments in the weeks since Charlottesville bear that out. They all sat on huge stones, yet, at least in our city, they have all come down. Now, those who want to keep the statues, our president among them, argue that they are founded on history and culture. We can no sooner remove Confederate statues, they say, than we can rewrite history. In fact, removing those monuments is akin to destroying our culture because our culture is founded on history and our history is preserved by those monuments. Yet, gone they are, nothing but their bare foundations of stone left behind. Now, in today's gospel, Jesus asks the disciples, who do the crowd say that the Son of Man is? And they respond, some say Elijah, the, John the Baptist, Jeremiah, one of the other prophets. And then he says to them, but you, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter says in reply, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him in reply, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. Now, there's a play on words that is occurring here that gets lost in the translation from the original Greek into English. So if you will indulge my nerdiness a bit, <laughs> It might be helpful if you have your missiles or if you take out the Bible and look at Matthew chapter 16, and we'll be looking just at verse 18, where Jesus says, And so I say to you, you are Peter. Now, the first thing you have to realize is that in the Greek, it does not say, you are Peter. It says, you are Petros. And we translate Petros into Peter. But you see, in Greek, Petros means a stone or a rock, as in an individual stone or rock. Jesus is, in essence, giving Simon a nickname. His name is Simon, but now Jesus says, from now on, I'm going to call you Petros. And I think if you really try to translate that into the English equivalent, it's not Peter, it's Rocky. <laughs> right? Yo, Adrian, right? <laughs> he says to Peter, you are Rocky. And that's his new nickname. And then he goes on and he says, and upon this rock, I will build my church. But the interesting thing there is that the Greek word for rock is not Petros, but Petra. Now, Petra means 
solid rock, bed rock, as in a huge rock formation. So, in essence, if you try to read back that line with a new understanding and translation, it might go something like this. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him in reply, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And so I say to you, from now on, I am going to call you Rocky. And on bedrock, though, will I build my church. And the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. You see, Jesus isn't building the church on rocky. He's building the church on bedrock. You see, there's a big difference between a rocky foundation and a rock foundation. So you see, just because something sits on a rock doesn't mean that it will last forever. While it's true that our Confederate statues are rooted in history, their main function is not to teach or preserve history. I don't know about you, but Growing up, I don't think I ever saw a statue of Socrates or Julius Caesar or King George III. But I sure shooting knew who they were. <laughs> now, if we started burning books or erasing tapes or blowing up museums, well, then maybe we would be destroying history but not by removing statues. No, Confederate statues, like all monuments, are not merely historical. They're cultural. Their purpose is to commemorate history, to honor it, to glorify it, or even to communicate a very specific message about history. In fact, history teaches us that most of our Confederate statues were not erected immediately after the Civil War to honor Southern heroes, but decades later to reinforce a segregated society and to remind and intimidate African Americans of the ugly power wielded by white segregationists. So when we debate the, propri the propriety of displaying Confederate statues in public places, we're debating the cultural propriety of glorifying people and events that many believe have no business being glorified. We're not saying that those people or events need to be erased from our history books or removed from our museums. We're just saying that they should not be given places of honor on public grounds. True, when we remove those statues from our public areas, we are removing parts of a culture. But as far as I'm concerned, they represent a culture that needs to be removed from our public squares. Because monuments that are rooted in culture necessarily have rocky foundations. Cultures come and go. Some are good, some are bad. Some are worth commemorating, 
and some are worth ignoring. Notice, for example, that Jesus did not build his church on Peter. Peter became the leader of the church on earth, but Peter himself was rocky. He was a mere man, and we know that from how much he flip-flopped in life. (laughs) No, Jesus doesn't build his church on Petros, on rocky foundation. Jesus builds his church on Petra, on a rock foundation. Jesus doesn't build his church on Peter. He builds it on the faith of Peter. For whenever we profess that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, then we are on solid ground. We are on bedrock, and Jesus' church can stand upon us. So rather than place our identity in our monuments and in the passing culture they represent, we need to place our identity in our God and in the church that he founded. Not because the church has all the answers and can solve all the problems. Lord knows that our church suffers from the same evils of prejudice and injustice that afflicts our larger society. No, we look to the church for our identity because it brings us together around a different starting point. The church is the place where we search for truth. And one of our biggest problems today is that we cannot speak the truth. In fact, our president holds the truth in disdain. And so he believes that he can rewrite the events of Charlottesville and his sorry response to them by his mere say-so. If we're to speak the truth in church, then I have to say that Donald Trump presents more of a threat to the preservation of historical truth. He presents more of a threat than the removal of any Confederate monument. Whether we can live up to it or not, at least the church calls us to the truth, to acknowledge the truth, to speak the truth, and to pray about the truth. And the church also calls us to love. Despite all our faults, the church is rooted in love, in God's love for us and our love for God and God's challenge that we love one another. And love is always more powerful than hate. And finally, the church calls us to surrender ourselves to God. For as much as we can accomplish on our own, God is the only one who can bring it to completion. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, St. Paul writes. How inscrutable are his judgments and how unsearchable his ways. You see, the church has the annoying ability to remind us that in the end, humans are only humans and only God is God. All we can do is place our trust in God, surrender ourselves to him alone, and have faith that God knows what he is doing much more than any of us ever could. You see, just because something sits on a rock doesn't mean it will last forever. Only the church can last forever because it is built on the rock foundation that Jesus is the Messiah, 
the Son of the living God. If we have faith in Jesus Christ, then we need not be troubled by taking down symbols of a culture that is rocky at best and malignant at worst. Steve Bannon remarked earlier this week that he welcomed the identity politics of the left because they will assure the ultimate victory of the right. Well, let me say this to Mr. Bannon. <laughs> my identity is not rooted in my politics, yes. in yes. my race, in my gender, and certainly not in the corrupt and defeated culture of the Confederacy. Yes. My identity is rooted in my faith that Jesus is the Messiah, yes. the Son of the living God. It's a faith that teaches that racism and hatred and injustice are sins against the God who created us in his own image and likeness. It's a faith that sits not upon a rocky foundation, but rests solidly on a rock foundation. It's a faith against which racism, bigotry, and even the gates of the netherworld will never prevail. Amen. Amen.